So what we're doing in this series is natural theology and further it's unbiased natural theology. I want to explain what that means. Theology, natural theology can be biased in two ways. The person doing it can have sincere belief or they can have some sort of fear. For instance, let's put ourselves back to the 13th or 14th century and let's imagine uh, a monk. Uh, let's imagine a St. Thomas Aquinas who has grown up in the Catholic Church who has never perhaps even known someone who wasn't Catholic who accepts the teachings of the Church wholeheartedly and without reservation. But someone with the mind of an Aquinas might decide that many of the truths of the uh, Catholic faith, so-called truths, could be deduced using natural reason alone. And that was one motivation behind the uncaused cause argument, to show that there must be something transcending the universe, to show that there must be a God. Today, a more popular, and perhaps a more widely known argument in natural theology is intelligent design. Um, so that biases natural theology because you have a certain thing you want to prove and you use logic just to prove that and then you stop. For instance, in intelligent design, the idea is that the human body, the human eye, whatever, is so magnificently designed that there must be an intelligent designer. It didn't come about just by chance or by evolution. So they argue based on what they see in the natural world, that there must be an intelligent designer. And then they stop because they've arrived at where they want to be. But once you get on the logic train, you really shouldn't get off until you've reached the end of your thread of reasoning. So let's suppose there's an intelligent designer who designed the, the human body. That intelligent designer must also have designed all the ails, ailments all the bacteria, all the viruses, all the organisms that hurt the human body. Must have designed the polio virus, must have designed intestinal parasites, must have designed all these things. So that would seem to suggest that the intelligent designer is an evil, malevolent intelligent designer. Now yes, there's a lot of good in the world. But if, um, say, a man and woman get married and the man treats the woman wonderfully for three years and then kills her, we would call him evil. We wouldn't say, well, yes, he did kill her, but look at all the good things he did for those three years. In the same way, we can look at good things in the world, but there are also things which are not so good that hurt us. So it's easy to think that if there is an intelligent designer, the intelligent designer is not entirely benevolent. Now, a Christian making the case for intelligent design at this point could cite the fall, you know, the fall of the Garden of Eden. But at that point, they're not doing natural theology anymore. So they use natural theology just to get to where they want to get to, and then they stop. Another reason why the natural theology could be biased is fear. Now, in the uh, Middle Ages, if you were known to disagree with uh, Catholic dogma during the Inquisition, or even if you were suspected, you were in big trouble. And once you had a case about this poor woman who was brought before the Inquisition on suspicion of secretly being Jewish. And her defense was she wasn't secretly uh, Jewish, she just didn't happen to like the taste of ham. I don't know what happened to her. But there have been times in the past, and today in other countries, there are countries where if you openly disagree with orthodoxy, you could be tried, convicted, imprisoned, and even executed. So these two motivations, uh, fear and predetermined conclusions, make a lot of what a lot of the natural theology that has been done biased. I mean, if you read that a Christian theologian believes that just using human reason, he can prove the Trinity, and a Muslim theologian believes that just using natural reason, he can prove that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, you have to suspect that they aren't doing it in an unbiased way. Now, in doing unbiased natural theology, we might come to some unpleasant conclusions. 
God is made to do a lot of work in religion. God gives us hope. God assures us that there will be ultimate justice, that evil will be punished, that good will be rewarded. God assures us that we will live forever in a paradise. Now, in doing unbiased natural theology, we're trying to establish the philosophical basis of our theology. And as such, we're constructing the tree trunk and the branches. And all those things that benefit humanity from religion are like the fruit of the tree. And in our search, we might come to some unpleasant conclusions. We might decide that when you die, you die. We might decide that evil and good are not punished and rewarded. It's just you die and that's the end of it. As such, what we're doing as of now, and maybe for the near future, probably won't be able to give that hope and solace and comfort that people expect of religion. Also, I think people doing unbiased natural theology need to have a solid foundation, emotional foundation and moral foundation. Because if we come to some conclusions, I wouldn't want someone going out and becoming severely depressed or suicidal or we're doing something that's basically let's think of it as for pioneers we're going into new territory and we're going to try to follow the reasoning wherever it goes and we may reach some wrong conclusions we may reach some disturbing conclusions and you have to be up to that task if you're looking for comfort and solace this is probably not the place for you okay Thank you.